Would you be surprised if I said that today's AI is actually stronger than the human brain? Now, I'm sure lots of you would scoff at the thought considering all the things AI still cannot do. But to be more precise, in this video specifically, I want to talk about computation speed. So how fast a computer or a human brain can perform computations. Even with that specified though, this still isn't a very easy task because as you might imagine, computer computations and brain computations work a little bit differently. It's not exactly, you know, an apples to apples comparison. It is not, however, impossible as this is actually a topic of debate that goes back a couple decades. So today what we're going to be doing is rounding up all that information and trying to figure out whether a computer or a brain is actually more computationally powerful. And I think the result might surprise you. It certainly surprised me at least. Before we jump into the content though, one last thing I want to say is that it takes a lot of time to put these types of videos together. And I do do a whole lot more of this type of content on this channel. So if you are interested, do consider liking the video, hitting that subscribe button and also the bell icon so you can get notifications. Thank you so much. Let's jump into it. Let's start with a little bit of background on how both of these systems work by taking a look at a single neuron in an artificial neural network and a biological neural network or something from the brain. So starting with an artificial neural network, which I'll display on the screen here, for each neuron, we have incoming synapses with weights, and these weights are just numbers. Those are multiplied by the inputs, which are outputs of the previous neurons, and then all summed up. The sum is then run through what we call an activation function to get the output for a single neuron, and then the cycle continues until you go through the entire network. Next, let's move on to biological neural networks, or I'll call these BNNs for short going forward. Now, there are a lot of different types of neurons in the brain, so we will be looking at just one type. But just a little disclaimer, this is just a general overview, not a representation of every neuron in the brain. On one side of the neuron, dendrites stick out in many directions, and these dendrites take in inputs from other neurons in the form of certain chemicals called neurotransmitters. That chemical energy then spawns electrical energy, which we refer to when it hits a certain point as electrical spikes. These spikes then travel through the dendrites, and once they reach around the cell nucleus area, they cause changes in the electrical potential between both sides of the neuronal membrane. Based on that, the neuron then decides whether it should spawn more spikes to send down its axons. If a spike goes down the axon, at the end of it, it will generate more neurotransmitters, which will lead to other dendrites and other neurons, and hence the cycle continues. Very clearly, the calculations or things that are happening in one of these ANNs is very different from what we see happening in a BNN. However, there are still some ways we can compare these. Specifically, what I want to do in this video is break down how much computational power we would need for a computer if we want to mimic the functional capacity of a brain. And by functional capacity, I mean we want to be able to do essentially anything the brain does, even if we aren't mimicking it to the smallest atom or molecule. To measure this, we are going to use a specific unit called floating point operations per second, or FLOPS for short. Now, a floating point number is just essentially a decimal number. So a floating point operation could be something like 4.78 plus 3 or 0 0.3489 plus 2.3 something, or you could do multiplication or division. It's all a single floating point operation. So what we can do to draw some sort of equivalence is try and convert the brain's computations into flops. And then when we hit the end of the video, what we'll do is loop back around and connect the numbers that we estimate for the brain and see how that compares to modern day computers, household computers, and everything up all the way to supercomputers. One way we can attempt to estimate the amount of flops of computation in the human brain is using a method called the mechanistic method. This method is discussed by Joseph Carl Smith in his paper on open philanthropy. So if you want to read more about this, I'll link that in the description. The general idea here, though, is that if we can understand how many flops are happening in individual synapses, neurons, and small elementary circuits in the brain, well, then we can scale those numbers up to account for the rest of the parts of the brain. Though the idea is simple, it does have some powerful implications and allows us to do some interesting calculations. 
One common place to start when assigning numbers to these different types of computations in the brain is to assign one floating point computation per spike that passes through a neuron. Now the reason for this is that spikes are important because they affect the electrical potential around a cell membrane. We can represent that change in electrical potential around the cell membrane as a simple addition operation, hence we get one floating point operation. Now there are several other ways we can compute this, most of which however actually suggest that we could represent this with maybe even less than one flop. However, I'm not too sympathetic to those arguments and I think this argument alone is already shaky enough, so we'll stick with this for now. So to figure out how many flops of total computation in the human brain, the next step is to figure out how commonly these neurons fire. Now the maximum neuron firing rate is around 100 hertz or 100 activations per second. However, the average is more likely to rest somewhere just below 1 hertz. However, this exact number is still very much in debate in literature and it does depend on which part of the brain you're looking at. So to give us some lenient air bounds, let's say that the average firing rate is somewhere between 0.1 hertz and 10 hertz. The last number we're going to want is how many synapses are in the human brain. To get that, we can start with the amount of neurons. The human brain has an estimated 86 billion neurons. For simplicity's sake, let's go ahead and round this to 100 billion. There are an estimated 1,000 to 10,000 synapses per neuron, so that gives us a total of 100 to 1,000 trillion, or 1 quadrillion, synapses in total in the human brain. We can now use these numbers to calculate the estimated flops for all spiking computation in the brain. The lower bound on our computation is going to be 10 times 14 synapses times an average firing rate of 0.1 hertz times one operation per spike to give us 10 to the 13 flops or 10 teraflops. The upper bound is going to be 10 to the 15 synapses times an average frying rate of 10 hertz times one operation per spike to give us roughly 10 to the 16 flops or one petaflops. So for synaptic transmission in the whole brain, we can estimate that there's roughly 10 to the 13 to 10 to the 16 flops happening. Now that covers communication between different neurons, but we still need to look a little bit closer at what happens around the cell body, because that's where the decisions actually happen as to whether or not neurons are going to fire. And this is arguably much more complicated a problem because whether or not a neuron is going to fire depends on a number of electrochemical properties regarding the state of the cell. Here I can show a table that pulls numbers for a few existing cellular models. We can see that most methods are comparable in computation to our synaptic transmission model or a bit lower. Some methods, however, do suggest much higher numbers. However, the methods from most of those models are either very new and have yet to be investigated further, or they're believed to be a lot more complicated than what's actually necessary to mimic just the functional capacity of the brain. And finally, by taking into account everything we've talked about so far, and also a few minor things behind the scenes, we can give a final estimate of about 10 to the 13 to 10 to the 17 flops for the entire brain using the mechanistic method, which is also 10 teraflops to roughly 100 petaflops. However, I really can't stress enough that this should really be taken with a grain of salt. And the reason for that is that this is an estimate based on more estimates. And beyond just that, we did fail to include several other factors that could potentially make this number go up a bit. Just to list a few, there are the spikes generated by dendrites instead of from the cell bodies. There's the possibility of information processing glial cells. These are similar to neuron helper cells. However, more recent research shows that they could be involved in some information processing. There's also communication between electrical synapses, and these are connections directly from neuron to neuron. And also aphatic effects, which are electric fields produced by the electromagnetic state of some of these neurons. Now that was a whole lot to go through, and I'm assuming you're curious how that compares or stands up to computers. I'm just very briefly going to go over a few other methods that we can use to estimate the amount of flops to mimic the human brain, and then after that we'll loop back around and compare those numbers to computers. The next method I'm going to mention is the functional method. Now this is similar to the mechanistic method, but except for looking at smaller groups of neurons and synapses, we look at much larger groups. For example, we could look at the retinal processing group of neurons, and that is something we know a whole lot more about, and we can compare it directly to AI equivalencies and stuff like that. We can then use those numbers and scale them up again to the entire brain. Lots of the estimates using this sort of method estimate around 10 to the 15 flops. 
The third method I'll talk about is the limit method, and it uses physical and energy principles to try and put a limit or a roof on the total amount of flops required to mimic the human brain. One of the estimates here is two times 10 to the 22. That is very high, but do remember that this is again a roof or a limit as opposed to an estimate of the average. The fourth and final method I will mention is the communication method. This method attempts to figure out how commonly there are signals going through synapses or how many traversed edges there are per second, and then tries to convert that measurement into flops using ratios similar to what we see in artificial neural networks. The estimates here range from about 10 to the 16 to three times 10 to the 17 flops. Putting the info from all four of those methods together, I would say that roughly 10 to the 14 flops to 1 to the 17 flops is a rough estimate of what we could expect is required to mimic the functional capacity of the human brain. And now the question I'm sure a lot of you have been waiting for, how does that stack up against modern computers and AI hardware? Well, first, let's take a look at the RTX 3060. This is a recent card released by NVIDIA, so it's still upper end, but it is something you could find in households. I wouldn't be surprised if lots of my viewers have it. And the number here sits around 10 to the 13 flops. Definitely a bit below our estimate, but not awful either. The next thing we'll be looking at is a TPU V3. This is hardware specific to AI developed by Google, and it's something you can get access to by either using their servers or using something like Google Colab. And the number here is roughly four times 10 to the 14 flops. And as you might've noticed, even with a single TPU, this is already breaking into the realm of our estimates using all of our other methods. This was really surprising to me that even with one single card, there is the possibility, even though it's on the lower end, that maybe it's enough to replicate the functional capacity of a human brain. But we can take this a step up and look at next a pod of TPUs or a TPU V3 pod. This is what Google uses mostly internally when they want to train their giant machine learning networks. And essentially it's a bunch of TPUs strapped to each other in a giant pod. And the number for this is roughly 10 to the 17 flops or higher, which as you might notice is actually on the upper end of our estimates. And this, this blew my socks off to say the least, because that's right. Based on these results, it wouldn't be surprising if we actually already have all the computational capacity we need to mimic a human brain. And given that information, I wouldn't be surprised if a question arises, well, why do we see all the stupid AI we do today? And why does it seem like we're still so far from artificial general intelligence? And there are actually many potential answers to that question. So let's go over a few of them. One reason is that software just takes time to make and is very difficult to build. People have been working on artificial intelligence for many decades now, but we're still improving every single day and advances are very rapid. So you can expect that software will keep improving and those improvements in software will lead us to some interesting places. Item number two is that flops are just one way or one thing that's necessary for these types of computations. We haven't even talked about bandwidth or memory capacity or lots of other things that are absolutely essential to having fast computations and large networks. And in addition to that, flops are also a really bad way of looking at biological computations because there isn't a one-to-one -one mapping. Even if we did look at all of that and we did have better software, you do have to remember that we have to do a lot more than what just the brain does. The brain is as good as it is because it went through evolution and we have periods where we go from babies to adults where we learn all sorts of things and our brain is pre-configured to work in certain ways. We have to learn all that. And to learn all that, we're probably going to need a whole lot more computational power than just what the brain works with today. One of the last reasons I'll mention is that ANNs are just a whole lot denser than BNNs. Now this might not necessarily be a bad thing, but it's certainly a difference. We can look at one of the biggest models recently, Switch C released by Google. This is a model with, I believe, 10 to the 15 parameters. It's a lot of parameters, but when we compare it to how many synapses are in the human brain, which is 10 to the 17 or 10 to the 18, well, we're still quite a ways off. And the reason that these numbers are off, but computers still have just as many flops is because they're a lot denser. And the frequency at which a single neuron in an artificial neural network spikes compared to the rate at which it does in a biological neural network, well, it's just a lot higher and it's definitely a different way of doing things. You might even be able to attribute this to what I just mentioned as to we have to use a lot more time for learning and going through these neurons many times instead of just doing inference as the human brain does. And before you say I'm wrong, I know that doesn't account for learning in the human brain, which it definitely does, but that's something I've left out of these computations for this video. Now, given all those factors, 
artificial general intelligence may still be a ways away. That being said, I don't think it's completely out of sight either. If you want to know more about this topic, I'll link a paper in the description by Joseph Carl Smith. This video was very much inspired by that. Lots of the information was taken from there. So many thanks to him. It's a great paper and I definitely recommend it. If you're interested, it goes into much more detail. If you want to hear about other ideas in this general field, for example, how neuromorphic computer is trying to emulate what the human brain does, or how we're using incredible artificial intelligence today to try to mimic human intelligence, do consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the bell icon for notifications. It really does mean a lot to me, and I put a lot of effort into these videos. Anyway, that is all I have for now, so thank you so much for watching, and I hope to catch you next time.